Today's sermon is an adaptation of a sermon preached by one of pastor's former professors on Life Sunday in January of 2007. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for our consideration this morning is taken from the Gospel read earlier. We call your devout Christian attention to these words of God. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to Jesus. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is our text. Dear friends in Christ, I bring you greetings from God our Father, who is so kind to you and who gives you peace through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters say it in a moment of jealousy. Maybe you've said it to your brother or sister. Mom always liked you best. You always were Dad's favorite. And I suppose parents can sometimes show favoritism too. What about God? Does he show favoritism? Can I point at you, or you, or you, and say, you were always God's favorite? The answer is yes. The word of God for us today reminds us that God's favor has been revealed to each one of us through his son, Jesus Christ. Today, God tells us that regardless of what we've done, God's favor rests upon us through the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. You always were God's favorite. Is that really true? In one sense, it's not. In terms of what we deserve, it's God's wrath, not his favor that should come upon us. Paul says that we were by nature children of wrath. That's Ephesians 2.3. Because of our sinful nature and the son, uh, sin excuse me, that it produces in our lives, we do not deserve to be God's favored sons or daughters. We deserve punishment. But do not despair. In another wonderful, grace-filled sense, you always were God's favorite. Paul says that God chose you and me in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4. God's words to Jeremiah could be spoken to each of us. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That's Jeremiah 1.5. In Psalm 139, God tells us that he knit us together in our mother's womb and that he saw our unformed substance. God chose you and me before the world began. God knew you before you were you. God was present and active in your development in the womb. Yes, there's no doubt about it. You always were his favorite. But just what does that mean to be God's favorite? That question brings us back to our text. Jesus visits his hometown of Nazareth. As was his custom, he went to the synagogue. He was given the scroll of Isaiah and asked to read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He begins. We know, of course, that he meant this quite literally, because when he finishes, he says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He was the anointed one. He was the one who proclaimed good news to the poor and who brought liberty to the captives and sight to the blind. In short, Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And there's our word, favor. The word favor, as used in the Bible, has to do with being accepted by God. To be God's favorite means that he accepts you. It means he accepts you based on his love for you, not on your ability to make yourself acceptable. That's what's being, is so great about being God's favorite. It doesn't depend on you or what sins may be lurking in your past. Being God's favorite means the past is forgiven and forgotten. In the Old Testament, there was a year of the Lord's favor when the past was forgotten. It was called the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, past debts were canceled, slaves were freed, and land was returned to the original owners. The size of your debt, how long you'd been a slave, or the number of years you'd been without your land didn't matter. Every 50 years, you got a brand new start. Wouldn't it be nice to get a brand new start? Well, that's exactly what it means to be God's favorite. 
Jesus came to give everyone a brand new start. What Jesus gives is much greater than having a debt removed or being freed from slavery. The good news Jesus brings is not just for those who are poor financially. It's for those who are poor in spirit, those who recognize their debt of sin and their inability to do anything about it. Jesus says, I favor you and have assumed the debt of your sin myself. You are brand new. The liberty Jesus proclaims is more than liberty for captives in jail. It's liberty for those held captive by sin. Jesus says, I favor you and grant you daily the liberty of forgiveness. You have a brand new start every day. The sight for the blind Jesus offers is more than physical sight. He gives the sight of faith. Jesus says, I favor you and my spirit will convince you of what you cannot see. You have brand new eyes that assure you I am present with you always. The release from oppression Jesus offers is more than release from oppressive rulers or governments. Jesus offers release from the burden and guilt of sin. He says, I favor you and have taken that burden upon myself. You have a brand new start regardless of your past. What does it mean to be God's favorite? It means he accepts you because of what Jesus has done through his cross and resurrection. It means he accepts you regardless of what you've done. It means he accepts you and sees you as brand new. Yes, you always were God's favorite. Acceptable, brand new. But just who is included in this? Is it really fair to include everyone? Think again about the year of Jubilee. Undoubtedly, there was some grumbling and complaining. Was it fair that a debt of several thousand dollars was forgiven just like a debt of a few dollars? Was it fair that some got hundreds of acres of land back and others got only an acre or two? Is it fair that God's favor should be extended to everyone regardless of the number of sins they've committed or the horror of their sins? The people in Nazareth didn't think it was fair. Oh, they spoke well of Jesus and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. But this lasted only as long as those words favored them. Things changed quickly. Jesus knew his fellow Nazarenes wanted him to do miracles of healing as he had done elsewhere. But he also perceived their lack of faith in who he really was. In Mark's account of Jesus' visit to Nazareth, he could not heal there because of their unbelief. Jesus then gives examples of old, in the Old Testament where prophets whom God sent to show favor to non-Jews. Elijah extended God's favor to the widow in Zarephath, and Elisha extended God's favor to Naaman the Syrian. The hometown crowd is suddenly filled with wrath. Not fair. How dare Jesus imply that God would favor non-Jews over us? They are so enraged at this perceived insult that they drive Jesus out of town to kill him. But this was neither the time nor the manner of Jesus' death. Jesus simply walks away. Rejected, he will extend his favor to others. We know better than to think we're good enough to deserve God's favor but we may sometimes struggle with the fairness of God's favor. How could God forgive so-and-so for such and such a sin? Is there favor for the rapist? What about the child abuser? On this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, we think about all who harm or take human life, everyone from the addict and his supplier to the purveyors of abortion. Sadly, we easily fall into the trap of thinking that God could not possibly favor certain people and very often we think of it for ourselves. The law written on our hearts convicts us. We know we've done something wrong and think God could never forgive. Because of a particular sin in our past, we doubt whether God could ever really love us, let alone whether we could ever be God's favorite. But God's favor isn't earned, it's a gift. It doesn't depend on you, but on the giver. Some sins burden us even though we know intellectually that God forgives. One of those we call out today is the sin of abortion. If there's anyone who might feel they could never be God's favorite, it's those who are struggling because of an abortion. Unfortunately, this truly moral issue has been hijacked and ransacked by politics and is called a matter of women's health. That is so very true, but not in the way it is usually meant. In addition to the emotional wounding, Abortion harms the woman's physical health, too. 
In pregnancy, a mother's body changes dramatically, both physically and chemically, to nurture the baby within, prepare for the birthing process in the child's birth, as well as to care for the infant outside of the mother's body. Medical termination of a pregnancy abruptly stops those physical, structural, and chemical changes. Nearly everyone finds it difficult to deal with the death of a child. It is just so unnatural. Now consider how this difficulty is multiplied when someone has made a choice that leads to the death of their child, even if it was forced upon them by a boyfriend or parents. It weighs heavily on the heart. They can never forget it, nor undo it. Many women speak of little ghosts that haunt them, triggered by something they see, hear, or think. Their minds flash back to what might have been and what really happened. Men who find out about an abortion after the fact may grieve not only the death of their child, but also the loss of relationship, having been cut out of the decision about their child. Those hurting because of an abortion decision in their past can identify with the words of our text that talk about being captives and oppressed. They feel imprisoned by their thoughts and memories. Those who struggle with the past, or abuse, violence, addictions, and whatever else may oppress them in their present, those are people that don't feel very favored by God. Perhaps you know such a person, or perhaps you are such a person. The message of God's mercy, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is precisely for such that person. The good news of this text for you and for all who are poor because of our sins is this. Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Through Jesus, God's favor rests upon us and his favor never wavers. Through Jesus, God makes us what we could never be on our own, acceptable by the forgiveness of our sin. Any sin, every sin. Through Jesus, God liberates us from the captivity and oppression of sin. Through Jesus, God says to, t to each one of us, you always were my favorite. We dare not be like the people of Nazareth and think that there are those who should not hear the message of forgiveness in life. There is only one unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. All other sins are forgivable. That is why churches of many denominations all across our country are talking about the sanctity of life today. Life is a good and perfect gift from God, first given to Adam and handed on through men and women from generation to generation. We need to bring an end to these ungodly practices that put an untimely end to human life, not the least of which is abortion, which kills over 3,000 babies every day in the United States alone. We must work to bring an end to the atrocities that wound so many women, men, and children. If we don't talk about the sin of abortion in our churches, it will never go away. If we don't talk in our churches about the sins against human life, we will never be able to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to those who have been caught up in these sins. But it must be more than talk. When we look at our Lord, there is no denying that he is pro-life. And that means much more than being just against something. We must be proactive on behalf of life. We must diligently ingrain in our children the sacred nature of life. We must unashamedly admonish one another to live sexually pure lives. We must open our hearts, our homes, and our wallets, if necessary, for those who feel trapped in a dead end with no other way out. We must find room in our pews for all sinners, we are called to live in the Lord's healing love and in service to others, mercied and mercying, valuing life at every stage and in every condition. If we don't, what's to stop them from eventually coming after each of us? There can be no excuses or lack of engagement. Imagine, if you will, that legislators pass and the Supreme Court upholds a law which says that once grandma and grandpa reach a point where they need more of your time or resources, you can just legally kill them. How many of us would say, well, I'd never do it, but I believe it's a right that others should have. Yet, that is exactly what we hear too many Americans, even Christians say, about abortion, assisted suicide, and the like. If in our churches we don't talk about abortion, end of life issues, and the blessedness of suffering with Christ, the only changes ahead will be even more gruesome, and the hurting will never have healing. 
The gospel message of the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake is a message from God for all people, and most especially those we may deem unworthy, including ourselves. Only the shed blood of Christ can bestow value and worth. It was shed for you. Only the precious blood of Christ sets the captive free. You may have said it in jealousy to a brother or sister. You always were dad's favorite. But Jesus says this to you in love. He says it to you regardless of your sin, regardless of the perceived size of your sin. Our Abba Father says it to you because in Jesus Christ, he made you acceptable and gives you a brand new beginning. So take it to heart. Take it personally when you hear that heavenly truth. You always were my favorite and you still are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>